what I want to do is just go over kind of how I program. Now, there are a few things that we need to understand before I just kind of show you the split that I'm going over and, and the program that I'm building out. How I train through for athletic development, because my biggest goal for athletic training is to have as much of it transfer onto the field as possible. With that being said, there needs to be the athlete needs to be doing their skill in their sport and practice in order to really help bridge that gap. Okay. This isn't like, Oh, overly specific type of sports specific training. There are sports specific qualities that are going to be enhanced, but for every athlete, and, and I'm sure the coaches know like that transfer really happens like by practicing your sport. So we're building a better athlete to be stronger, faster, more explosive, all of that, better rotation, better coordination, all the things that are going to make the athlete perform well in their sport and giving them the tools to do that. And then they're applying all of that through practice with their, their actual skill training. We train through what I call the six pillars of athletic training or athletic development. Okay. So whereas most athletes that come to me, they either come from a, oh, I was doing a bunch of bodybuilding type split before because that's super popular, or it's a powerlifting and we're trying to get as strong as possible type of split before, or it's some sort of like crossfit variation. While those are all good in their own respective, those are only single focus, right? Like powerlifting is just get as strong as humanly possible. That's their sole goal, right? bodybuilding is build as much muscle, be as extended as, as possible, right? And then CrossFit is like, I mean, there's a little bit more CrossFit. I'm not going to demonize on CrossFit. They do some good things. They do some bad things. It's gotten a lot better. Okay. But with athletics, right? Athletes are required to be strong. They're required to be fast. They're required to be powerful. They're required to be agile. They're required to have good mobility coordination and hopefully stay injury free as much as they can. Okay. So we're not following one sort of type of training that is essentially popular right here, right? Athletic training is getting a little bit more popular, but those are the things that we're training through, right? It's strength. Okay. So like, I'm not going to lie, like how we're trying to get our athletes strong so they can produce force because force is the other side of the equation of power. Okay. So like, this isn't just a bunch of lightweight, moving fast, bunch of banded stuff all the time. Like there are times when I'm trying to get our athletes strong as humanly possible. Okay. With strength comes some added stability, right? And that stability is going to help with contact. It's going to help with keeping you safe, right? Like all of those things. So we're trying to get stronger to use some methods um, to help make that happen. Everything that I'm going to talk about is in some way, shape or form to, is after like explosiveness, is after power, right? It's after making our, our athletes the most powerful, most explosive and be that for as long as they can. So power is the next thing that we're after in the next kind of discipline or pillar that I call. <clears throat> and power lies on a spectrum. It's not just heavyweight fast. It's not just lightweight as fast as you can, right? We'll train through the force velocity curve. You've heard of that term. So just think on the, the, the high end, it's high force, very low velocities, right? So like max effort kind of squat, right? Moving slow, grinding a rep out. That's maximal force. On the other end, it's very high, high velocity. Think of like a sprint, but low force. Okay. And throughout the spectrum, there are going to be different qualities that we're going to be trying or adaptations that we're going to try to get from those different points. Okay. So on more of the higher velocity side, we're working on things like elastic strength. We're working on things uh, like tendon stiffness. We're working on our like bodies and central nervous <clears throat> central nervous system to have a contract relaxability um and then on the other end of this thing we're, we're working on like muscle driven force we're working on like rate of force development so there's all these little points and all these little things that will contribute over to over to overall more power okay so that's why it's not just like cookie cutter kind of like just heavyweight fast okay so strength power speed is the next one um so when we're talking about speed it's top speed, it's acceleration. Um, each of those has their own different qualities. Okay, so top speed is going to be more elastic driven. It's going to be more of that contract relaxability. Um, you're going to get a lot of the uh, top speed from some of, them, some of that tendons ability to recycle some of that energy. Acceleration is going to be more focused on like muscular driven power output. Okay, 
And then with the speed aspect, we're also working on running mechanics for the different phases of, uh, of a sprint, right? So drive phase, transition, top speed. Now, so strength, power, speed, agility is gonna be the next one. Okay, so agility, we're working on things like footwork, body positioning, ability to decelerate, reaccelerate, reaction time, okay? So strength, power, speed, agility. Then I put kind of three in one because I think they all really work uh, together and it's often neglected. It's mobility, stability, and coordination, okay? So mobility, right? Kind of what everyone's thinking, range of motion, being healthy, being safe, but mobility is range of motion under tension, okay? So ability to access those ranges of motion and also be strong in those ranges of motion. How mobility is gonna impact some of your power output, speed output, right? A, a simple example that I like to use is during running, okay? So if we have an athlete who has poor hip mobility and can't necessarily lift their thigh up high enough during a sprint, they're going to have less distance that they can generate force and put their force down into the floor to generate more power, right? So imagine you're trying to like break a two by four with your hand or not a two by four, but any plywood, right? And you can, you only get this much room to hit down versus you have someone who has this much room to hit down, right? You can generate a lot more force with it. Okay. So that's how mobility can impact some of your power output with stability. Stability is how I think it's like joint stability, core stability, right? If we lack stability in a joint due to many different factors, maybe previous injury, different things like that, it's going to be the weak link in the chain. Okay. So if say we lack like hip stability, right? But you go to push off your leg and there's uh, instability at the hip, there's going to be some shaking and force is going to kind of dissipate through that, right? It's not going to effectively transfer throughout the full body in order to get the most amount of power out. Of it. With coordination, really thinking about muscle firing sequence, right? So um, muscle firing sequence, the easiest way I can kind of explain this and demonstrate this is like if you're a boxer, combat sport type of guy, you're throwing a punch, right? <clears throat> we want to get the most amount of force and the, the biggest, what's called summation of force transferring throughout our entire body. Now, if we, and this is like big example, but it, it happens at a very minute scale, right? But if you go to throw that punch and your shoulders go, then your hip turns and then you push off your foot, right? In the reverse order, it's not gonna be a very powerful punch. Versus if we did it in the correct order and fired it all sequ sequentially together, you're going to be pushing off the foot, internally rotating at the hip, turning the core out through the chest, shoulder, tricep, arm, right, and into the hand, right? So you're going to link that chain together. So that's what I'm thinking about in terms of coordination. Um, and just, that's why we'll have some drills that require some uh, more coordination um, to work at a broad scale to help these athletes out. The last piece is conditioning because you can be as big as strong, as fast, as, like you could look really good on paper, but if you're gas, like none of that matters, right? That all goes through, that all goes uh, out the window, okay? So with conditioning, we're thinking about, we're training the energy system to have what's called a greater capacity and then something known as repeat power, okay? So <clears throat> real quickly, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. We have three different energy systems in our body. So we have our creatine phosphate, which is like zero to 10 seconds, max effort, think like 100 meter sprint, max power clean, that sort of stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna get a lot of that type of training um, and training that energy system through like power training, lifting, some of that type of stuff. We can target it directly with some specific types of conditioning protocols, um, but we're gonna get a lot of that through the like strength training stuff that we're gonna get. The next one is our glycolytic system. Okay, so that runs up to about two minutes. Okay, still really high intensity, still like 80, 90%. And that's primarily where a lot of athletes are gonna be spending their time. Because with most sports, not all sports, but most sports, it's high levels of effort, intensity, sprinting, whatever it is, brief recovery, and then expected to do it again, okay? And then the last one is our aerobic, uh, or it's called beta oxidation. It's our aerobic system, okay? That just means with oxygen. And that is, uh, I think, like the marathon runner, okay? That's like low, steady state, kind of going for a long time, like zone two type work. 
it's not that any are more important than the other. We need all of them. Um, but typically with our sports, we want to emphasize those top two a little bit more and increase the repeat power and capacity of those so that we can recycle that energy. Okay. So repeat power just means high levels of effort intensity, brief moments of recovery, doing it again without it significantly dropping off, significantly dropping off, right? Like it, it, you want to be able to do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. Okay. And then just capacity just means like longer duration that you can handle this. So those are the things um, that I am thinking about as I'm programming and it's a lot, right? <laughs> so that's why it doesn't just fit into like a bodybuilding split or a powerlifting split. Those are all the concepts. Those are the things that we're thinking about when we go into our, like, how do we program this out? Right. There's a lot of methods. There's a lot of different things that are out there. We use some of those methods. The overarching principle with a, with this is that we are doing, we are following what's called progressive overload. So for any strength gains, power gains, speed gains, there needs to be some, like in some way, shape or form, a progressive overload, right? Which all that means is that you're adding a little bit harder stimulus on the body in order to tell your body, hey, we need to adapt to either get stronger, faster, more powerful, more mobile, whatever it is, okay? Now, our first phase is a foundational phase, okay? So this is like general physical preparedness for some of the coaches out there. Um, GVP. So in this phase, we are trying to build some base levels of strength. We're working on improvement movement quality. We're working on improving some like mobility if there's any deficiencies there. And then in terms of like our power work, it's a little bit more like skill acquisition. Okay. So especially with like the Olympic lifts, we're regressing those way back. We're teaching like proper hip hinge, getting the hips through. And then in terms of like our plyometrics, we're starting at the, we're starting the ground up. Okay. So we're starting with our feet. We're teaching, we're developing the ankles. We're developing the tendons to be able to handle forces. And then eventually we'll get to redirecting those forces. So those are like hops, skips, jump ropes, things like that. We have a few uh, extent or intensive plyometrics. So there's extensive and intensive plyometrics, extensive or like little hops, skips, things like that, that are very cyclical working on some elastic strength, developing the ankle strength a little bit. And then we have intensive, which are like your big broad jump or power-based stuff. Okay, so the, we're going to spend a little bit more time on the, the extensive, a little bit on intensive plyometrics. Okay, so that's our foundational phase. Um, like I said, strength, there's a little hypertrophy, some work capacity is what, what I'm really after. So that's our body's ability to handle harder and harder types of training because in our next phase, which are strength and power, like we're going to get after it. Okay. So next phase, like I said, is strength and power. We're going to be doing, like, <laughs> we're trying to get the athletes strong. Okay. So we're going to, I typically follow a modified conjugate method, um, which there is max effort days and dynamic effort days. So Max effort, think heavy strength work, okay? Dynamic effort, we're lightening the load a little bit. We're adding things like bands and chains, and we're focusing on acceleration through the movement, developing a little bit more power on the higher end of that spectrum of that force velocity curve that I talked about, okay? There are a few caveats with that. We're going to do some cluster sets on our max effort days, and we're going to involve some contrast training so we can get a little bit extra power work. Our, the plyometrics get a little a uh, little bit more dynamic, right? They get a little bit more power focus. We're going to add in more uh, with the speed training. We're going to get a little bit more focus on the acceleration component and agility component because acceleration is going to be predominantly more linked to how much like lower body power that, that there is. Now we're, we're working on like run mechanics and things like that as well, but it's primarily acceleration focus because with most athletes, um, except, ex except if they're exp like pretty experienced, like a track track guys, 90% of the time their acceleration is limited or it's poor mechanics, poor power output. And that's typically why they're slower. And when we, we fix up some of the acceleration issues, they get faster one because they're shaving time off their start and two, their top speed actually gets faster because they, they can accelerate a little bit quicker into like that distance. The next phase is a power into speed. Now we're not getting rid of strength training. We just don't want to be like, okay, strength's gone. We're just only going to focus on power speed. We'll do some undulating periodization, daily undulating periodization for those that you know that what it is. I think it's a really good way to start to transition through this. We'll have one day that's focused on strength 
pretty basic strength training where it's the, the big movements plus a lot of like carries for core stability, hip stability, that sort of stuff. Um, a little mobility in there. We'll have a power focus day. We're going to start to implement some power contrast mm-hmm. sets or complexes. Then, uh, so we'll, we'll at the Olympic lifts, we'll get a little bit more involved. So instead of doing like a jump shrug and clean pulls, we'll start to move into like a hang power clean or uh, power clean with power. It really is exercise selection dependent on the loads that you want to use. Okay. And, it, and it's athlete dependent. So on this phase, I might do some velocity based training to be able to really get the adaptation that I'm looking for. Okay. So with power will be between, for those that know, it's about 0.75 to just over like one meter per second. So I use a, and I have some of our athletes use a it's like metric VBT. I think it's a free app. It'll give them the velocities. And if they're going to use that, I don't even care about the weight that they're, they put on the bar. I care about the speed of the bar that they're, they're actually using. If not, I'll prescribe out the percentages based off of that. So typically with like more of the Olympic lifts, we'll go a little bit heavier on the scale. Some of the, some of the other stuff will go a little bit lighter on the percentages, focus on speed of the bar. After that, we typically have a velocity day. This is like, it's not a very intense day. So we get a little bit of like wave loading throughout the week where it's like very intense, kind of moderate light, which works well with some of our speed training that we're doing. Really, it's like 20 to 30%. On this, I'm working more uh, like trying to get them really focus on the amortization phase of the lift. So there's concentric, eccentric, and isometric for those that don't know. Concentric is the lifting portion of a movement. Eccentric is the lowering portion of the movement. Isometric would be just like stationary, right? And there's a little piece called the amortization phase where it's from the eccentric to the concentric portion of the lift, okay? And I'm really trying to get them to focus on being able to quickly transition from here to here and back out. Okay. So that's like that explosiveness that a lot of people talk about. Explosiveness is really like how quickly you can get in and out and produce a lot of force. Okay. So I'm really focusing on like with all of our plyometrics, with all our movements, we're really focusing on like the amortization phase and working the stretch shortened cycle on it's, it's much more like elastic based for what we're doing. And then on the field, we're focusing a lot more on like top speed and, and improving top speed mechanics. The fourth phase is all about peaking, and I'm going to show you the actual like workouts and stuff here in a second, okay? So the fourth phase is all about peaking. It's like, really, this is something that you do going into season, going into a fight, whatever your sport or competition is. It's literally about becoming the strongest, fastest, most explosive, best in shape version of yourself. So we'll still have some speed, but we'll have some extra conditioning in there as well, because like I said, you need to be in good shape to be able to perform at a high level for a long time. What that peaking phase looks like, okay, so this is... Um, the new phase of training that's coming out in our peak performance program, it's 3.3, that's year three, three months. So we have quite a few like training programs in here. In the past, I've done some French contrast training. So French contrast training is just a play on contrast training where you're p- working on different points throughout the board force velocity curve to elicit something called, that's called post-activation potentiation. So essentially what that means is that you have a heavy or power-based load that excites the nervous system to produce a lot of force. Then you go into a power or plyometric based movement and with a little bit of rest, not a lot. And you get a greater performance on that power or ba- power base or plyometric based movement because your muscles are excited. Your central nervous system is excited. It already has, pro- it's already been required to produce a lot of force. So you kind of hack your system into like your body still thinking it needs to produce a lot of force. This is the overarching split. It's a three day a week split. There's some other stuff in here too for our combat sports, which I'll get into. Okay, so when we're doing top speed, I want these athletes as fresh as humanly possible because with speed training, with power training, you need to be fresh and you need to be hitting 95%, if not better times or power output in order to tell your body, hey, we need to adapt to get faster, okay? So top speed training and power training has a lot of rest, okay? It doesn't seem like a lot. This is where a lot of athletes mess up. They're like, oh, I want to get faster. I want to get more powerful. But they end up not resting enough. And those, when you're not rested, right, you have some fatigue in the muscles or just overall like aerobic fatigue, you're not able to produce as much power or produce as much speed. So you're not hitting the threshold that we need in order to tell your body, hey, we need to get more powerful. We need to get faster, all that type of stuff, okay? Um, so it's small volume. It's max effort, a lot of rest, okay? 
So we'll go through our sprint warm up. So thigh switch. This is really to teach the athlete how to aggressively pull up the thigh and punch into the ground. A march, A skips, just working proper foot mechanics and punching into the ground as well. A lot of athletes will actually hit in front of their their hip, and we want them hitting right underneath or slightly behind. C our C skip isn't. Uh, this is more like a high knee butt kick. It's to teach uh, teach a quick back cycle. Um, so there's not a long swooping back cycle so they can get into better positioning when they contact the ground. And then we're going to warm up the hamstrings a little bit. Again, getting some rhythm in, rhythm in here, a little lateral work, a little bit of power work, uh, backwards run before we go into our dribble series. Our dribble series is again, this is just to work the ankle and it's to work proper foot positioning and to slowly get the athlete to understand the responsiveness from the ground or off the ground in their foot and the foot and ankle complex working so they, they can feel the, the pushing and, and proper foot mechanics with that. We'll go into a little bit of mechanical work, uh, sprint mechanic work with some wickets that are stride control. This isn't very tough, um, but again, it's teaching the quick back cycle, proper knee, like getting the knee up and through and then contacting the ground underneath it so they're not reaching. Um, and then we'll do a full length one. And then we'll do some fly pens. Um, typically, I'll start off a little bit lower, um, but it's five minutes rest. And then you can see down here, I put time yourself when you have two consecutive times that are slower than your best, then you're done for the day because then we're not working top speed anymore. Okay. And then there's optional conditioning to do. So we do the conditioning at the end because um, you don't want to do it before because you'll be fatigued. And if you do condition, my personal thought on conditioning is it doesn't matter if you're already a little bit tired because that's what we're trying to train anyways is to get you in better shape. Okay, so we'll have some uh, 100, 100 yard sprints. These will change throughout the week um, depending on uh, what we're doing for that day. Um, and then there's some time intervals to uh, for these guys to hit. So pretty basic stuff there. Our lower body strength and power. Um, this is a hip flow. You, if you guys want to see what this is, I have it on my YouTube. You can go check that out. Um, it's like a five, mm, seven minutes. It might take you like 10 minutes at first, but it's really good. Uh, full lower body mobility uh, works, especially for the hips. Some jump rope. This is, again, just to get their body warm, get the blood temperature or the, the temperature up and my way of sneaking in a bunch of extensive plyometrics without taking too much time. We'll get into a little bit of a superset here where we're working. Uh, so two depth landings where we're sticking that landing. Um, so stick the landing for two and then we'll go into a repeat jump. So a depth to vertical jump. So we're getting a big kind of eccentric uh, overload into a force production going on up. So a lot of stress on the tendons there, which is really good for helping improve that. Again, this is our fourth phase. So we're going to be a little bit more unilateral work. So we would have started at a front squat or, or a similar movement, maybe a goblet squat and worked up to this. Okay. So a rear foot elevated barbell squat <laughs> is what we're doing. Uh, this is a hat filled variation. I put a lot of substitutions in here, like reverse lunges or Smith machine, um, but we're really focusing on single leg force production, getting everything we can out of this. This is as heavy as you can. Um, I haven't gone in and programmed the, the like numbers and percentages out yet, but this will be like 80. I haven't yet, but I'll put progressions in here. Typically I'll start a little bit lighter on the progressions, maybe like 70 to seven or 75 to 80 up to about 83 the first week. And then over the weeks, I'll just slowly progress it up and take the number of reps down. And I might add a set, okay, just in general for everyone. So heavy strength work into power work. So sled push, want the weight a little bit lighter, about 30 to 50% of a velocity decrement. So all the velocity decrement means is that, say it takes you two seconds to run, um, 15 yards, a 50% velocity decrement would just be doubling the time. Okay. So find a weight that doubles the time. Okay. So that's where we're, that's how we're going to maximize the force side of things and velocity side of things to get maximal power output. Okay. And then we're going into a plyometric based movement. So this is going to be more on the velocity side of things. Okay. So we're just simply working through the uh, force velocity curve to elicit some post-activation potentiation. Okay. No, 
I normally in this phase, like I said, I've done French contrast training in the past, but I honestly think that just complexes work better and it's a little easier for all of our athletes to do, especially if they're working out at like a commercial gym or anything that I typically am with our athletes. Okay. Sometimes four exercises, hogging all the stuff doesn't typically work. And I think that the complexes work a little bit better for them. So this is more of a quad focus, uh, <clears throat> squat pattern, and then we'll hit our posterior chain. Okay. So banded RDLs, these will be pretty heavy. Um, as heavy as the athlete can while focusing on getting in and out of that amortization phase where you're going down and coming back on up. So as soon as they feel that big stretch, they're ripping and driving <laughs> up as hard as they can to work on that amortization phase. And then going into a typical kettlebell swing where that that's the speed of that amortization phase is just going to be even faster. Okay. So even working a little bit more on the, the, the in and out and the explosiveness of the hips, we'll get into just a full body, Movement, Turkish get-ups, core, shoulder, hips, everything. This is a great movement. We'll hit a little bit of some uh, hip adduction iso banded rows. Um, all that means is that we're up. Let me see if I can pull this up for you. Um, let's see this a little bit, right? So it's like a Copenhagen isometric plank with a row. So we're getting a little bit of um, like the oblique sling to work. And we're getting, uh, what I really want is the, uh, adductors right there to help prevent like any growing injuries. Cause a lot of people will get growing injuries and then they wonder why, and they never trade their actual adductors. And that's, that's cause they're weak. Okay. And then after that, we're just getting into some mobility. So hip mobility, um, and then a little hamstring and then a little bit of like T-spine plus quad and hip flexor. Um, so really it's not a long training session. Um, the focus is on maximal effort and intensity here, maximal effort and intensity here. Give me what you got here and then recover and get out. Okay. The upper strength and power, uh, plus conditioning. I typically like to add some conditioning at the end of upper body days, if we can, um, during this phase, because this is going to be really taxing on the body and central nervous system. Upper body days aren't necessarily going to be as taxing on the body. Um, so we'll go through our warm up, get our sh shoulders going. We'll do a contrast set, uh, for some horizontal, uh, like chest, shoulders, triceps. Okay. Where we're trying to maximize force output, take that post activation potentiation into a very explosive, very quick, very rapid movement with the floor chest pass. We'll do the same concept for a horizontal pool, heavy dumbbell row into an explosive sled row. This is going to be single arm. So we are going to get a little rotation with this, some, a little bit of internal or uh hip rotation with this and then it's a big pool okay so there's not much there's not many exercises that you can get a true like power based training with the back but this is one that i've found that works really well um you just have to keep the load pretty light so that you're getting at least two to three yards um per per pool and have the athlete actually give you the everything they got this is going to be a, some coordination, some power work here. So landmine row to press. Um, this is a really good one for our athletes. Um, let's see. So this isn't super heavy, right? Here, let's slow it down a little bit. So, oh, you son of a gun. It's too fast. So here, again, we're getting rotation. The athlete is driving up off the legs initially, and then they're rowing up, and then there's the quick transition, but most of the power is coming from the hips right here. So this is really good for a lot of our like combat sport guys, any rotational athletes, really good here. And then it's just a transfer of force out throughout the arm, okay? So yes, you're getting pressing, but it's really more of a full body one. Um, I don't like when the athletes hop and turn because you take away the actual torque that's happening at the hips. And that's really what I want. So I want this front foot essentially planted. Um, it can turn a little bit, but most of this is pivoting here. Okay. So the same thing like baseball swing, all that type of stuff, that front foot is typically planted and the rest is happening behind to maximize the power coming throughout it. And then uh, we have conditioning at the end. Okay, so 
with this conditioning, it's just a, this is a little bit more emphasis on um, the first two energy systems as we go through the round. Like my goal with these is to have the athlete go as heavy and as hard as they can, move the weights as quick as they can and keep, just basically keep that up, okay? I'm gonna let the aerobic capacity happen and like they train the aerobic system happen as they get more fatigued and as the rounds go on. I have the assault bike sprint in here, 15 seconds, because I want them to, to work on that free peak power, even in a fatigue state. Okay. So we're modifying the, the duration is going to happen. I want the, I want to take control of the intensity. And then the last day is a full body. Um, so we'll get into some power cleans, we'll work up to some pretty heavy weights. Single arm dumbbell split jerk. This is a very, uh, yes, you can go heavy. There's a lot of like core and hip stability and coordination that has to happen, especially as you land and control. Um, so there's a lot of like dynamic core uh, stability and control that has to happen here. We'll get single arm dumbbell bench press. Again, there's an isometric anti-rotation that's happening here, um, plus some um, strength training that's going on. Then we'll work the lateral chain. Okay, so some goblet lateral squats or goblet lateral lunges into a banded skater. We'll hit the hips and hamstrings. So <laughs> now we're gonna move into it's like pretty heavy over here on where are we at on this day. This is gonna be a little bit lighter and focusing on movement control and like getting the hips involved again. So the single this art plus rotation. We're trying to rotate at the hips, right? So you do an RDL and then you rotate at the hips and then come out from it. So we get a little hip external and internal rotation as well. TRX shell is a knee dominant hamstring curl. Okay. Also the hips are involved. Um, just hit the hamstrings a little bit more. And then we'll get into a little bit more rotational power for the core. And then a little bit more like dynamic core control here. And then we'll get into our acceleration, agility and conditioning. Okay. So working the start, we'll do some post-active or we'll work contrast sets on the sled sprints here. Uh, again, 30 to 50% velocity decrement into a sprint. So heavy or moderate to light to moderate sled, sled sprint into a normal sprint. This works really well to help our athletes with running mechanics and teaching the athlete how much force they actually need to push into the ground. They always feel a lot faster after this. Um, some agility work here, and then there's some optional conditioning. This is going to be more of the um, alactic, kind of the first two energy systems here with a big rest. Our combat sport athletes um, will either do like a, a hang power clean or a uh, like a kettlebell swing. The reason I have this is again, I want them to have to produce high like high power output even in a fatigue state. We'll get some sledgehammer swings, keep the power going. Sea otter walks is going to be one that allows us to just continue to like work kind of like grunt work. Plus we get a little upper body. It lets them recover a little bit, but they're still working. And then we put them through a, uh, quarter, a quarter mile jog. So probably around minute 30 to two minutes, 400 meter. So essentially high levels of effort intensity into some, downtime and then forcing them to do it again and then forcing them to do it again right so they're working on having high levels of power output high levels of force output even in a fatigue state 